All right, uh, welcome everyone. Today we're going to be talking about epigenomics. So we are here in the gene expression and epigenomics uh, part of the lecture of the of the course. Uh, next week we're talking about regulatory circuitry and networks. So today we're kind of building that up. Okay. So today we're going to be talking about epigenomics, which is the first foray into gene regulatory circuitry. And that sort of follows the expression analysis and RNA analysis that we heard last week. And today it's looking a little upstream of that as to what are the things that control gene expression. On Thursday, we're going to talk about the three dimensional folding of the chromatin. And next Thursday, so on Tuesday, we don't have classes because of Columbus Day. And next Thursday, we're talking about regulatory genomics and uh, regulatory circuitry. So a lot more about motifs and how things are interconnected. And then we're going to have two uh, lectures on networks, one on um, sort of cellular networks and one on uh, neural networks. So deep learning and neural networks. Okay. So that's what's coming ahead. So for today, <clears throat> first I'm going to introduce epigenomics. So what is epigenomics? Um, then I'm going to introduce uh, the primary uh, data processing pipelines that we need to carry out, including something that we alluded to at the RNA mapping lecture, which is Burroughs Wheeler Transform. Remember, Bowtie had BWT as part of its name. So today we're actually going to look at BWT and how it works and why it's su super awesome and fast. And then we're going to talk about uh, how to combine data from many different marks, many different um, lines of evidence for what is the underlying state of the epigenome at that location, which we're going to call chromatin states. Uh, then we're going to talk about model complexity, something that a lot of you have been asking about uh, when we learn about HMMs, how many states, when we learn about um, uh, k-means, how, how many clusters, what's k, and so on and so forth. So we're going to talk a little bit about cluster complexity in the context of multivariate gene markup models. And then we're going to uh, talk about how we learn stoic and chromatin states jointly across many cell types. And then lastly, we're going to talk about epigenome imputation. So as the data sets get denser uh, and larger, there's going to be some gaps. And we want to figure out how to fill in those gaps and how to leverage these increasing matrices. Ready with me? So look at your hands. Look at your nails. Look at your hair. Look at your, um, you know, friends, eyes, and nose, and, you know, feel your pulse. It's kind of cool, right? All of these different types of organs and cells have exactly the same genome. It's hard to fathom that your eyelids and your eyes and your retina and the nerves that process it and your brain that listens to what I'm saying have exactly the same code running in them. It's mind-boggling. It'll blow up your brain first and then your eyelids and all of these different cell types will blow up. If they only could understand how complex it is that the same three billion letters encode this huge diversity of functions. Like if you look at your skin, you know, you may not have as much hair as I do, but uh, for, you know, every single hair, there's this massive machinery for sensory and sweat and, you know, uh, innervation and uh, you know, feeding and growth and replenishment and immune system. It's, it's unbelievable that every single square inch of your, of your uh, body has so much complexity from such a diverse set of interplaying cell types. And, you know, that's just looking at your skin. The brain is amazingly complex. Your immune system, every single one of your internal organs has incredibly complex and yet they all have the same DNA. The analogy that I like to give is as if every human profession had a single volume, a single sort of encyclopedia of 23 volumes, 23 human chromosomes. And whether you're a physicist or an alchemist, <laughs> hopefully that's not around anymore, <laughs> or a uh, you know, poet or a mathematician or a, you know, athlete, you all get the same encyclopedia. But every time the athlete shows up at work and every time the physicist shows up at work, they open different chapters. So, what your epigenome allows you to do is effectively bookmark your genome for each of those chapters. So basically every profession in the body, every cell type, if you wish, uses a different part of that encyclopedia. Okay? And the way that this is possible is through the epigenome. So first of all, 
the, the epigenome helps package up the genome from two meters worth into, you know, uh, 10 to the minus compaction. Um, and uh, second, it also serves informational roles. So not just structural roles in holding the DNA together, not just compaction roles in sort of making it tiny, but also uh, informational roles. And the three types of information in the human epigenome uh, consist of DNA methylation, which are basically a CH3 group. You can see here the carbon and the three hydrogens, which is added on C nucleotides most of the time, followed most of the time by G nucleotides. So CPG methylation, which we talked about um, in the first HMM lecture. And then um, the second type is DNA accessibility. So whether a protein can actually access the DNA. And the third one is these cool, li cool little things here. So these are called nucleosomes and they're made out of histone proteins. Every 147 base pairs of DNA is wrapped around twice, ra wrapped around twice around each nucleosome. And every nucleosome has eight histone proteins, two of each type, H2A, H2B, H3, and H4, each in two copies, okay? And every one of those histone proteins has a long tail. And that tail can be post-translationally modified with a large number of marks that can then be read and um, written, okay? Raise your hands if you're with me. Awesome, great. So this is basically the, the, the most basic picture of the epigenome. And there's, you know, one or several types of methylation. There's mostly one type of accessibility, but then there's more than a hundred different types of histone modifications. So every single one of these histone proteins can be modified and you can actually have uh, modifications at many different positions. Most of the time it's sort of license that gets um, modified. For some reason, they're easier to access somehow. And um, we will talk about sort of histone H3, remember H3, H4, H2, H2B, histone H3, lysine 4, this is the fourth position as you go down, which happens to be a lysine, trimethylation, which basically means you've added three of those little black, yellow, uh, you know, white, white, white little things. Everybody with me so far? So that's basically uh, one type of modification. And that basically means that this histone protein has a modification at that position, which has three methyl groups. But that same histone protein may have an acetylation mark at position 27 and a triumphylation mark at position 36 and so on and so forth, okay? So what we're looking at is effectively a putative combinatorial code of two, two to the hundred different combinations for every one of those proteins, okay? Which is, again, mind-boggling. It basically says that the complexity of the epigenome might be humongous, and you have that every 147 base pairs which are wrapped around and about a 50 base pair linker. So at the resolution of roughly 200 base pairs, you basically have this immense landscape of modifications, which can then remind every cell what are the important chapters in this book of life that it should pay attention to for its profession. So if I'm a liver cell, I'm gonna open up chromosome 17 at position 722, you know, <laughs> 156. And the way I know that is because I have a bookmark there that basically tells me that's an active enhancer in your cell type, keep going to it. Who's with me so far? Awesome, question? Did you have, no, any questions? All right, so that's the challenge before us. Basically what we're trying to do is figure out the language of the epigenome using these uh, different modification marks. And the, that language will basically teach us about different classes of elements. So we'd like to de novo just by watching all these modifications across different cell types, infer all the different types of uh, elements in the human genome that are uh, en enhancers. These are distal regulatory elements. These are extremely cell type specific. Promoters, these are proximal regulatory elements. That's sort of marking where the polymerase, the RNA polymers will start making RNA. Um, where the transcribed regions are, where the repressed regions are, and so on and so forth. And every one of those classes, we and others have learned, has distinct classes of signatures. For example, enhancers are defined by 
monomethylation in the fourth lysine of histone H3, and acetylation of the 27th amino acid, which is a lysine in also histone H3, and DNA accessibility. By contrast, promoters don't have H3K4 and E1, they have H3K4 and E3, and more K9 acetylation than K27 acetylation, but also much more DNAs, and so on and so forth. So basically, these types of combinations is something that we would like to discover to know. Yeah. So only the No, many of them. So it just happens to be that licenses are the ones that I'm talking about more often. Um, but, you know, there are others. Yeah. Yeah. What a great idea. What a great question. So the question is, I'm a liver cell and you're a liver cell. Um, how, how similar are we? The answer is, uh, what is the answer? Um, the problem is that it's very hard to, to give you an answer. One way to look at it is to look at the single cell level. And we're going to talk about single cell genomics much later in the term. Uh, what is the accessibility profile of two cells that are also both liver cells? And the answer there is that within your liver and within your brain and within every one of your tissues, you have dozens of different cell types. So I shouldn't be saying liver cell, I shouldn't be saying brain cell, I should be saying, you know, layer five excitatory neuron or, you know, um, pancreatic islets that are beta you know, producing and so on and so forth. So um, there's, there's many different cell types within each tissue, and that is obvious to all of you guys. But now the question is, if you are two different, you know, pancreatic beta islet cells, then how similar are you? The answer to that is extremely complex, and the reason is that we don't have the technology, Frank. If you look at single cell epigenomics, they basically, you know, it, it, it gives you accessibility or not for every location in the genome. And that basically means that at every location, you do an experiment across the whole genome and then you ask at every location, did I get one sequencing read, two sequencing reads, or zero sequencing reads for that location in the genome? And that's it, because you only have two copies of every chromosome. So it's very difficult to sort of get data that is reliable at every location in the genome. Number one. Number two, even if it was, our, our, our technology is still pretty crappy. As, as amazing as they are compared to a few years ago, you know, the historians of the future are going to be laughing at us for how bad our images of single cells are nowadays. And therefore, it's very difficult to know that because your two pancreatic beta islet cells look different from each other, is that the technology or is that the biology? So uh, at the single cell RNA-seq level, we have a little more uh, uh, ideas. But again, all of that will come at the single cell lecture. And the answer is that it's a huge spread of the distribution, but still all of the cells of the same cell type are kind of like behaving similarly. I hope that answers your question. It's a fantastic question. Any other questions? No? OK. Great. Who's with me so far? Yay. Awesome. So. What we and others set out to do is understand the human epigenome systematically. So basically in a large consortium, which is called the Roadmap Epigenomics Consortium, we basically uh, profiled more than 100 different uh, primary tissues and primary cells and cell lines from different in individuals. And then for each of those, we basically went and profiled each of these different marks. Okay? And we basically said, can we learn the language of the epigenome from that? And this is just the first wave of many, many such consortia. So basically, we need to map multiple modifications in multiple cell types, in multiple individuals, across multiple species, in multiple conditions, with multiple antibodies, and across the whole genome each time. And there are many different projects that are sort of going at it. So, you know, human encode, mass encode, modern code, blueprint, roadmap epigenomics, IHEC, and others. Um, so this is sort of the, the landscape and these are the challenges. Uh, now the question is, great, how do you actually even measure the epigenome? So first we're going to talk about, um, you know, what are these experiments that we're going to do? And actually we're more like here, chip seek, etc. And then we're going to talk about primary data processing. So 
How do I figure out where are all these modifications sitting on the genome? It's a hard problem. I can't visualize it. I can't just look at it in my microscope uh, across the whole genome to figure out where every modification is. And even if I could, I, I wouldn't be able to tell the individual modification. So what can I do? What I can do is basically uh, feed a bunch of that modification to a rabbit or to a goat. <laughs> it sounds like a joke. A rabbit and a goat walk into a bar and the barman says, hey, what would you like? And the rabbit says, H3K4 translation, all of it. <laughs> Um, anyway, it's terrible. <laughs> uh, but, but, but basically, these, these bunnies and these goats, which are full of super yummy animals and super cute, don't eat them, um, <laughs> um, have basically the ability to, to, to generate antibodies against something foreign. And when we put a lot of that foreign thing inside their blood, we basically force them to generate these antibodies that, that are able to sense these new antigens that are, that are being produced. And therefore, their serum contains a lot of these antibodies. So then we ask them kind of nicely and they give us a little of their serum. Don't look at the details. Um, <laughs> and then we end up with antibodies that can pull down that modification because the immune system of the bunnies and the goats was able to tune itself to recognize that modification. Who's with me so far? Awesome. So what we can do now is basically couple these antibodies to magnetic beads and chop up the DNA of whatever cell we want to study and let these antibodies fish out, remember the fishing rod example at the beginning, uh, fish out uh, the, all the locations, all the little fragments of the genome that had that modification. Raise your hands if you're with me. Awesome. And what can I do then? Then I can just hybridize it to a microarray, that's old school, or sequence it with next generation sequencing. And what I end up with is gazillions of reads that scatter across the genome that basically tells me, tell me where does that modification go? Where is it found? So here's an example data set. You basically profile H3K4 ME1, H3K4 ME3, and H3K36 translation. Okay? And then you basically get a bunch of reads, each one telling you that, oh, there's a sequencing fragment that was pulled down by the antibody specific to that antigen, i.e. that modification. And then you map it to the genome and you ask, how often did it map here and here and here and here and here? Who's 100% with me on this picture? 100%, great. Who's not at all with me on this picture? Who's sort of a little confused about this picture? Okay, ask any questions. Yeah. I want a question that you might be jumping in on a little yeah. bit, but uh, don't, doesn't the ability to tell if it's keeping real or not also Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a fantastic question, and you are totally jumping the gun. <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's a great question. It's the same thing that everybody's wondering. All right, so what's a peak? Is this a peak, or is this a peak? And, you know, is this a peak? You know, is the context helping me find a peak, or helping me say that this, in fact, was not a peak? And maybe is that a trout? Is that sort of the opposite of a peak? Because, you know, it's lower in the context of higher. Frankly, we don't know. No, I mean, I, I'm serious. We actually don't know, like the whole world. You ask the best people in the world and they really, it's very hard to get a consistent answer. If you ask three experts, you're probably gonna get seven opinions. <laughs> it's, it's that bad. And the reason is that no one actually gave us the, the handbook of here's everything about the human epigenome that humans will eventually find out from 2100. I mean, we just don't have that textbook yet. Okay, we should ask Marty McFly or something um, next, next trip. Just come back. And, um, anyway, so basically the problem is that, uh, A, we don't, we don't have the right answer. However, we have hints because these epigenomic marks are related to all kinds of other stuff in the gene. And those hints can basically tell us, hey, where are the motifs localized relative to the peaks? What does that tell us about what peaks are real and what peaks are not? What are cofactors. 
if I do, you know, position experiments, if I look at where the nucleosomes are, etc., we can get a hint that basically tells us what is ground truth. And once we have ground truth, we can work backwards and say, all right, what are the best peak colors that best capture that ground truth? Does that answer your question? All right. Any other questions? Okay, so um, that's the experiment. We basically pull things down and then we either hybridize or we sequence and then we end up with a map like that, okay? And the problem, of course, is that you don't have just one view of the epigenome because H2K4 ME1 or ME3 by themselves is very limiting. Instead, you have dozens of views of the genome. Basically, you have one ground truth over there and then you're capturing, you're sort of, you know, looking at this elephant from different angles and you sort of you know touch here and you visualize there and you smell there and so, and so forth and then each sense gives you a different partial view of the elephant but together they basically tell you what's going on at every location of the genome and then from that we would like to infer the underlying language of um, chromatin okay so the question is great these maps look great but computationally i would like to start with a gazillion reads that are just sequenced, for example, 20 million reads, which is typical for an experiment. And I would like to map 20 million reads to the genome super fast, okay? Blast is awesome, but 20 million blast searches is extremely slow. And part of the reason is the memory footprint is huge. I would like to be able to do that on my lab. So that's where, <clears throat> the Burroughs Wilder transform comes in, okay? So how do we map millions of short reads to the genome repeatedly? And we're gonna talk about traditional hashing schemes and also BWT. So uh, you want to align reads to the best matching location in the reference genome. So this is not about homology anymore. This is about identity. Basically, you're not finding things that are evolutionarily related. You don't need an evolutionary model. You didn't need to do the neighborhood search of BLAST and all of that stuff. All of that's overkill. What you're trying to do is just hash things, like you know, first process your uh, genome somehow, and then map things really, really fast to it, okay? So you have 10 million reads, 30 bases long. Here's one example. You're allowing mismatches, you're allowing some sequencing errors or some SNPs, and then you wanna be super algorithmic and memory uh, efficient, okay? So I'm gonna wait until you guys find it. Just whoever finds it first, just raise your hand. And then I'm gonna to flip to the next page if you don't find it here. It's gonna be uh, a few thousand pages. All right, so it's, it's a slow problem, okay? Uh, it's here, as you guys all know, you're, I know you're too shy. You're like, <laughs> I'm gonna answer the difficult question later on. Um, so how did you do that? You basically uh, started searching CAG everywhere and so on and so forth, okay? That's a very slow algorithm. Uh, we saw how we can make it linear time with um, uh, hashing by basically making it probabilistic. But that's again, <clears throat> a huge database that I have to store in memory. And that's very memory inefficient. And that makes any computer run slow. So if I have to have, you know, in memory, the whole human genome, that's very, very slow. Uh, and especially a hash table that basically tells me about every location in the genome and all of the cameras and where they're happening. That's a very long table. So I don't want to do that. What do I want to do instead? <coughs> again, um, all of these are super slow. Instead, I want to use uh, the burroughs wheeler transform, and that's order of M. That's basically as fast as it is to just read my query. I can just search the entire genome for my query, okay? This is mind-boggling. So basically, as fast as it would take you to just read this, you can find that, look, that, that like all of the places where this occurs in the genome, okay? So that's, that's sort of what we're gonna be doing. And the idea is you're gonna be first pre-processing your genome without increasing its memory footprint. In fact, by decreasing its memory footprint. And just to tell you how <coughs> transformative the burroughs wheeler transform was, <coughs> no pun intended, um, it became the norm for every major uh, algorithm and tool out there. So if you look at, um, you know, this, uh, uh, this tool it basically first was introduced in uh, 2009, I believe. And then every single tool, basically SOAP became SOAP2 with a burroughs wheeler transform. And then MAP, MAX became, you know, MAX2 with the burroughs wheeler transform and so on and so forth. So every tool basically was uh, 
hundreds of times faster, okay? So this is, again, I mentioned Steven Salzberg uh, before when I, when I introduced Bowtie. Uh, this is the paper, and it basically was 300 times faster than the competing program. So you could wait 300 days or one day, which would you choose? One day. So everybody started doing this. So how does it work? Here's traditional hashing. Traditional hashing basically goes through every position of the genome and then builds a list indexed by KMERS, where in that list, you basically say, where are all the places where that KMER occurs, okay? So then if I have my KMER, I just go down the list in my database and I have a linked list that basically tells me here's all the places in the genome where that occurs. Very inefficient. The burrs guler transform instead says, I'm gonna have a database that's effectively the size of my genome, or actually slightly smaller. And I'm gonna create this by shuffling characters in an interesting kind of fashion. And I'm gonna create a series of suffixes of the read really fast, that allows me to increase my search by sort of going down that list, okay? So let me explain first, how do we make this shuffling? Then how do we use this shuffling to obtain the original genome? And then number three, how do we use this shuffling to search any substring in order M time, okay? Where M is the length of the substring. Who's excited? A. Awesome. So we're now going to transform bananas by chopping them up and shuffling them around. Okay. It's super yummy. Um, so here's the word banana. And I'm going to put a character in the front and a character at the end that are unique, that don't appear anywhere in my genome. And then I'm going to do the following. So I'm going to take the word banana and I'm going to do all possible rotations of banana. So banana, banana, a banan, na banan. <laughs> Anaban, Nanaba, Ananab, and Banana. Okay, so I've basically made all rotations of Banana. And then I'm gonna just sort them alphabetically. Okay, so there you go. All the A's are here, the B is here, the N is here, and the ad is here. Everybody with me so far? So, yes. And the added character is kind of arbitrary. Exactly. So basically, the start is the second to last, and the stop is the last. Okay? Everybody with me so far? And then my uh, parsing of the genome is not going to be the first, because that's kind of boring. It's kind of like the shorted list. It's going to be the last column of that shuffle. Okay? So here's my processed genome. Okay? You probably think I'm crazy, and not just because I'm reading this out loud, and you're wondering how could this ever be useful, okay? The first thing that I'm gonna tell you is, as promised, that I can recover the original word from this, okay? So why is this useful, first of all? This, this was invented as part of bzip2 to basically compress big files by basically putting together strings of characters that are the same. And therefore, it's much easier to say there's 700 A's coming and to say a a a a a a a 700 times okay so that's why this was invented because it actually leads to local clustering of these um of these very very long files everybody with me so far so now the second part is yes not only is it no bigger and actually very often smaller than my genome but can i recover the original strength from this okay so if I give you this, can you figure out that you started out with banana? Raise your hands if you can. One answer. Is that a hand? Yeah? No? No? Maybe? OK, the answer is on the board. Um, and it's, come on, trivial. Uh, so here's the, here's the trick. The trick is the following. If I have the last column of this shuffled list, can I obtain the first column? Raise your hands if you can see that. Awesome. Who wants to give out the answer? Um, raise your hands again. Who can see how I can get the first character? Go ahead. How can I get the first column from the last column? Um, so the first column is like the next thing after the letters that you have on. Like the, 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 
Yeah, good. So how can I get the first column? Okay, let me ask the, ask the question differently. How can I get the first column from any column, including the last? Yes? I'll do what he says. Sorted. That sounds great, right? Because, again, this is the sorted list. So the first column is just a sorted version of any column, including the last column. So if I give you the last column, you can get the first column by sorting, right? You now have the last column and the first column. What can you do? These are all the possible rotations. So can you get the second column out of that? Sure. I can get the first two characters by basically taking the last column and the first column together and then sorting that. And then I get the first two columns. Raise your hands if you're with me. Awesome. Good. So basically, if I only give you the last column of that, you can basically get the first column by sorting. And then I add the second column because I know that they're consecutive. They're all rotations. So then I sort the combined thing and then I immediately get the second column. Then I can put the last one first and resort and I get the first three columns. And I sort that and each time add the last column back to it and resort. Everybody with me? So then that basically means that I can obtain the full list sorted again and then when i'm done i can just take the first column or basically simply look for the row that starts with the start character and then that's my original string everybody with me so far raise your hands if you're with me awesome great so all i showed you is that i can mess up your genome and i can recover your genome right i didn't tell you that this is actually useful okay so now let's see how is this how in the world is this possible useful, okay? So again, the BWT transform is this, and the reverse function is that, okay? So, <clears throat> uh, Jason Ernst uh, made this slide a few years ago when he taught uh, this lecture, and he basically decided to search for this very weird name that actually happens to have some internal repetition. So, Manolis Kellis, okay? So, if I search for the word Olis inside a genome called Manolis Kellis, then how could the Burris Willer transform be possibly useful? Okay. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use just the last column and the first column. The last column is what you get out of the genome. And the first column is probably a copy of the human genome that you have sitting around. Somewhere. Okay. So if I'm searching for the last character and I want to find all the places where the last character occurs, it's super simple. I just look at the first place where S starts. And at the last place where S starts, and I have two pointers that basically tells me every string that contains S is here. And then I insert one more character. I'm basically expanding the um, length of the suffix that I'm looking for. And now I'm going to look for IS. Okay? IS is also super simple. It's basically all of the places where I occurs. Okay? So if I have the S here and, and, and I'm looking for anything that has an I before the S, the I before the S is just the last column. Basically, every time I want to insert a character, I just look at the last column. And now all of the places where I S occurs are just here. And if I want to insert one more character, I just look at the other side. So my search function, which is 10 lines of code, is basically keeping two pointers that are basically telling me where's the beginning and where's the end of all the substrings that end in these characters. And as I scan through, I'm basically reducing this, but jumping around in the genome, okay? So for the first character, all of the strings are here. And for the second character, basically if I have lengths of two, all of the strings are here and the third one are here. So basically I have a window with the first pointer and the last po pointer that is currently, that is constantly shrinking, okay? As I'm basically doing this exercise of going from the last column to the first column, okay? And that basically means that I don't need to actually even search strings, I don't need to extract strings, I don't, I don't need to look up my database. All I need to do is maintain two pointers that are between zero and three billion for the length of the human genome, and that are constantly sort of jumping around the genome to find every substring. And how long does it take me? 
It takes me one step for every one of those, which is basically the time that it takes me to just read that substring. Who's with me so far? Raise your hands. Awesome. So that basically allows you to, in a super, super fast way, map one read. If I want to map a second read, I just do that again and again and again and again. So if I have 20 million reads from my ChIP-seq experiment and I, want, and I want to map them all, what I'm basically doing is 20 million times this mapping. What do I end up with? I end up with a count matrix that basically tells me all of the places where I found all of these substrings. 20 million things have been added to my genome, but not to my original genome, to my modified genome. What do I need to do next? I need to reverse this operation to get these counts back onto the original gene. Okay? Raise your hands if you're with me. Awesome. Raise your hand if you feel like you learned something. Excellent. Good. Who thinks this is kind of cool? So this is super blazingly fast. It started out as a compression algorithm and it was then turned on its head to become a super, super fast, very high memory efficient search algorithm that basically allows you to now search the whole genome in effectively the length of reading uh, M just by adding one suffix at a time and then jumping around each time, okay? So the full algorithm is there, but the take home is that it's very little memory usage, the same as the input or less. You don't represent the matrix or the string, just pointers. And then to encode, you simply sort the pointers and to decode, you follow the pointers. So, So, <clears throat> um, we can talk about that in rest station. So it's, um, you know, a little more involved. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so you could basically do it using n log n but that's time that you're spending before the search even begins. Or you could do radix sort or something like that because we know that you have a fixed small alphabet. You could actually just put things directly into bins and just simply count how many do I have of this, how many do I have of that, and then you immediately know where does it go. But just by counting the number of A, C, G, and T at every position, you know exactly the ultimate location at every sort. So that's, again, super fast. Okay, so the original application was string compression because runs of le uh, letters were compressed into letter and run length. And then the bioinformatics applications are any kind of substrate searching. So I'm giving it to you, I'm presenting it to you in the context of epigenomic, but you know, it's the same thing that we use for super fast mapping of RNA sequencing reads and you know, anything else. Uh, but it's very, very memory efficient and therefore there's actually very practical and very huge speed gains. And you can then map hundreds of thousands of reads, only transform once, pre-process once, read the counts in the transform space, and then transform once, and then map the counts back to genomic coordinates. Sounds good? So <clears throat> that's just uh, read mapping with hashing, suffix trees, and more, more, much more importantly, Burr's will transform. Then you've mapped your reads. You'd like to now know, was this a good experiment or not? And there's many different quality control or QC metrics that you can use. Uh, and, and these have been put into a large number of pipelines and a large number of projects. What I'm showing you here is probably one of the most widely used ones, which is this encyclopedia of DNA elements. Okay. So the first quality control is to basically say, great, when I'm pulling down signal, and that's related to your question, when I'm pulling down, you know, regions of the DNA, does that depend on the antibody that I'm using? or simply that this region is generally accessible. <clears throat> the way to know that is that you carry out your experiments twice. You do your ChIP-seq experiment once with your antibody and pulling down you know, all of the regions that come with that antibody. And then you do it again without your antibody. And then you ask what regions would always come down. So if I say, Harry, you know, Harry shows up, and there's like, you know, Mike always shows up. If I say Sam, Mike shows up again. Mary, Mike shows up again. So we want to figure out who always shows up and who shows up only when we call their name. Okay? So we normalize by dividing by how often every region showed up 
versus how often did it show up when we actually called its name. Everybody with me so far? Great. So that normalization is the very first thing that you do to basically get rid of any kind of biases uh, there. The second is to basically look at the quality of the reads because as I'm sequencing my genome, remember I'm imaging with a T and I'm imaging with A and I'm imaging with C and I'm imaging with G and every time that there's a nucleotide incorporated in any one of my hundreds of millions of reads, I basically have a little like blink of light. Okay. As I get to 10 and 12 and you know 18 and more nucleotide, that quality starts dropping. And as you get to 80 and 90 and 100 nucleotides, the quality is really abysmal. So you can basically ask, where are my you know, high quality reads? And they're usually high quality nucleotides and they're usually at the beginning of the read. And then they drop off. So if I have mismatches later on in the read, it might actually just be sequencing errors. And then there's some low quality reads that just start, start out with very poor uh, quality scores. And but that's basically the uncertainty with which you're calling that data. You can actually ask what is the fraction of reads that are mapped. You can basically um, uh, ask, you know, how many reads are mapped uniquely, how many reads are mapped multiply, and how many reads are mapped not at all. And these not at all could simply be because some portions of the genome might be unique to each person. The multiple could be simply because there's a lot of repeat elements in the human genome and you're just simply not certain. And then unique ones are the ones that you really like a lot. So basically, if something maps uniquely, it's good. So, you know, one quality metric is how often are these reads mapping uniquely. You can also ask about the complexity of your library. That basically means how many unique molecules does it have? Because basically, you do your ChIP-seq experiment. If you pull down 20 molecules from your ChIP-seq experiment, and then you do an amplification, and you, then you sequence 20 million reads, you're going to have a million copies of the exact same starting position of each one of your molecules. So there's a library complexity that basically tells you how many unique molecules did I pull down from my experiment. And then there's the uh, redundancy that comes from, you know, the, 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 the number of reads with which you sequence that library. And if you don't sequence deeply enough, there are molecules that you'll never sequence. But if you don't have enough molecules, then sequencing more deeply will not help because you'll be capturing the same molecules over and over again. Who's with me on that concept? Okay, so on one hand, you have library complexity. On the other hand, it's how deeply you, you sequence that library. And you can tell a low complexity library because when you sequence, you're going to find the same starting position and ending position for a bunch of your reads. That basically means that there was only one RNA molecule or one DNA molecule that you're sequencing over and over again. Okay, and you can tell something about the overall complexity based on the resampling probability of how many times they sample the exact same molecule twice or three times or four times and that curve follows an exponential distribution and then tells you immediately what is the complexity of, of your library and how many of those doublets should you have to make sure that you've captured all singletons for example and so on and so forth everybody with me so far so another very important uh, quality metric that, it, that actually helps you understand these experiments uh, more deeply is cross correlation namely when I carry out a chromatin immunoprecipitation sequencing reaction, I'm basically looking for regions that um, contain a particular histone modification. In order to contain it, this better be a region that starts from the left of it and goes all the way to the right of it, or that starts from the right of it and goes all the way to the left of it. Okay? If that region ends here, I'm simply gonna, not going to see it because the, the way that I pulled that region of DNA down with my antibody has to do with, you know, the, the DNA actually being sequenced and being pulled down from my antibody. So that basically means that I'm pulling down all regions that contain this histone protein or this transcription factor that's bound there. Who's with me so far? So that basically means that if I look at all of the reads that are coming from the left of these DNA molecules, and all of the reads that are coming from the right of these DNA molecules, they're going to be slightly shifted from each other. And that shift is going to be exactly the fragmentation length of my library. How big were those fragments? So when I look at the left and the right, they're going to be peaking at slightly different locations. One slightly to the left and one slightly to the right, 
just because of this fragmentation size. And that basically means that if I now look at the cross correlation between these, the forward and the reverse reads at different offsets, then there is an offset, which is my fragment length divided by two, where I'm getting maximal correlation. Who's with me on this? Awesome. And then if I go further, I'm getting, you know, lower correlation again. So I can basically look at the cross correlation profile of my forward and my reverse reads as a quality metric to basically see if indeed I get this very nice characteristic curve. And if I don't, that basically means that something went wrong with my experiment. For example, if my peak is instead sitting at the length of a read rather than the length of my fragment, that basically means that not much happened in my chromatin immunification experiment. Okay. So comparing the read length versus the fragment length peak tells you a lot about uh, these experiments. Okay, everybody with me on uh, cross correlation? The next step is obviously peak calling. So uh, you have this contiguous signal across the genome and you'd like to transform it into reads, okay? So how do you do that? Well, um, it's an art. There's no science behind it. It's very difficult to sort of have a ground truth answer because peaks are sort of a figment of our imagination, not something that, that the genome actually cares about. Um, and there are many different technologies for doing that. Basically, the, you know, the, the basic idea is I'm going to be scanning my genome and looking for more reads from that location than I would expect by chance. Okay? How do you quantify more? How do you quantify chance? What is the window that you're using? What kind of shape is your distribution? There's a lot of, you know, um, design parameters around that. And that basically results in many different types of algorithms that are very widely popular and very widely used for this. Two of the most widely used ones are Max and PeakSeq. They were also used in the ENCODE project. And, you know, you can distinguish these algorithms based on, you know, whether they are window-based, whether they are clustering tags or, um, you know, what kind of density estimators are they using? Are they strand-specific? What is the peak height enrichment? You know, do they do background subtraction and so on and so forth? Okay. So this is a good reference to basically understand the full parameter space for peak calling, which is by no means uh, small. And for each of those, you basically have some kind of probabilistic model for how am I drawing reads? What is the underlying distribution? And a very common distribution, which actually fits the data quite well, is a Poisson distribution that basically says, I'm sort of sampling with, re with replacement. And, you know, because there's a large library and therefore, you know, I have some expectation of observing reads at any one location that follows this Poisson distribution that basically tells you the p-value is simply the Poisson variable of having the count greater than x. Okay. And then from that, you can basically decide on a threshold and then choose all locations that have some p-value greater than the threshold. Who's with me so far? Great. So... Uh, you know, there's problems, of course, with thresholds, uh, and you can sort of see how are different peak colors related with each other, uh, with, you know, with one another uh, on this. The last thing is you would like to know, uh, if I carry out the experiment twice, how should I combine the two experiments? Okay. I have one replicate and another replicate. So, you know, I'm looking at this, and then there's some peaks that are called by this one, but not by that one. How, how should I combine them, okay? One way would be to take the union. And if you take the union of all the peaks, it basically means that any kind of noise that creeped into one of them will basically creep into the final result, okay? If you take the, inter into the intersection, that means that if this is a true signal and this one missed it, you're gonna miss whatever any of them missed, okay? I don't know if you guys have seen this demotivation poster which has a bunch of hands together, it says meetings. None of us is as dumb as all of us. <laughs> um, so if you take the intersection, you're gonna be you know, as um, uh, insensitive as the worst algorithm. If you take the union, you're gonna be as unspecific as the worst algorithm, okay? So clearly union or intersection is not good. You could add them up, but again, that's unsatisfactory. It's as if you had done a single experiment. Why bother doing replicates if I could just sequence more or something of one of them? Um, 
Another idea is to basically say, let's use both of them together. Let's basically go down the rank list of each of the experiments and then ask, as I go down the rank list of my first experiment, how often am I replicating in the second experiment? Basically, what is the rank at which I can uh, still recover that peak? Okay, so if the first experiment has a lot more sequencing reads than the second one, then you're gonna have you know, bigger peaks, so it's gonna be a little unfair to compare them evenly, but if you do this rank-based comparison, you're basically asking, how far down do I have to go before I stop replicating in my second one? Even if my replication rate is at 10% or at 1%, I can still see this change where I stop replicating. And when you see this change, you're like, okay, that's where you should stop adding more peaks from the experiment that you're testing. And when you do that, the second experiment might have 20,000 peaks and the first experiment might have 200 peaks, but they're both useful for the other. You can use the 200 peaks to basically say, what is my replication rate as I go down my rank list of the 20,000 peaks? And maybe by 13,000, I'm gonna stop replicating in here. And that's when you're gonna to have to stop. So you can keep all 13,000 that are still replicating at the same rate and vice versa. If I have 200 here and they stop replicating after 70, then you know, I can use the other one. Does, who's, there, who's with me so far? So what this basically is called is uh, this irreproducible discovery rate. A lot of you are familiar with FDR, your false discovery rate. When you have replicates, there's no truth, but there's replication. So instead of false, you basically say irreproducible. So that's what IDR does. So basically it has this two component mixture model and it only looks at the ranks and then it basically models them as this um, cupola model that uh, captures these distributions. Okay. All right. So uh, we've basically talked about sort of the importance of epigenomics, the basis of how I carry out a single chip seek experiment, the mapping of the reads, super, super fast, and a lot of different quality control metrics, including cross correlation, how to find peaks, and also this irreproducible discovery rate. Who feels that they've learned stuff? Good, awesome. Um, let's take a 30 second break and then we're gonna do uh, crumbling states. <clears throat> so stand up, stretch, this is mandatory. All right. Yeah, welcome back. So I think we're probably gonna stop at the end of four today and then we're gonna do five and six on Thursday along with the 3D, epigene, the 3D genome. So um, what is the next challenge? Remember the first thing I told you is that there are many different types of evidence in the genome, in the epigenome, that uh, we want to combine in order to learn something about the underlying state of the chromatin in every cell type. But up until now, we've only talked about each mark at a time. We haven't talked about combinations of marks together. So that's what we're gonna talk about now. Basically, how do we use combinations of many marks to learn the underlying state of the chromatin? So we have a lot of observations, wink, wink, and we're trying to learn something about the hidden, wink, wink, state of the world in a fashion that captures the proximity or the quote, unquote, temporal, wink, wink, order of things along the genome. What would you use? An HMM, what a great idea. It's hidden, it's a model, and it's Markovian, which basically means that it walks <laughs> along the genome, which is great. So uh, we're gonna use an HMM. And 
are we going to use a uni variate HMM? Because we have many variables. We have multiple variables. So, so what we're going to do is use a multivariate hidden Markov model, which has everything we want. It's like you found the perfect date. What are you going to do now? I don't know. Look no further. Um, so anyway, <laughs> so so that's what that's what a, a, a you know a very natural representation for this is that we're going to basically model hidden states of the world as the hidden states of our uh, model of our, of our HMM, and the observables are going to be the chromatin marks, and there's going to be a vector of observables at every location. And we're going to use that vector to infer the most likely hidden state, understanding that there is some memory. As I walk along the genome, there's, you know, I'm in a transcribed state, I stay in that transcribed first state for a while. If I'm in a transcribed state, chances are that there's going to be a promoter state nearby, and so on and so forth. Okay? So it's a very natural model. And uh, my postdoc, Jason Ernst, developed this tool called Chrome HMM, which basically is simply a, an HMM for modeling Chrome. Okay? So you basically have a series of hidden states. Every hidden state emits not one, but a vector of marks. So this is the emission vector for the first state. And then, uh, you know, the question is, how do we learn these combinations? And because our focus was so much on these combinations, our design choice was not to model the actual magnitude of emission, but instead the probability of emission and to binarize the data into present, not present. And for this, we use a Poisson statistic again, and we basically say, how many reads do I have total? If I split them up evenly across the genome, what is the probability that any one location will have you know, that many reads? And then that, that gives you the binarization. So after you've binarized the data, you basically learn a hidden Markov model that captures these vectors of emissions. So in this particular case, we've learned 51 hidden states, and every one of them emits a vector of 40 something marks. Okay? So this is a multivariate in Markov model. It emits a vector of not just of, of values, not just one value, and you can emit real values. So Segway is another program that you can use to segment the genome, uh, and then uh, it, it emits real values, whereas Chrome HMM it, it simply emits presence absence, and you can use that to learn mark combinations. Okay? So that's the emission matrix that basically tells you, given the state that you're in, what is the probability with which you're emitting each of these marks? And this is the transition matrix, which basically tells you, given what state you're in in position i, what is the state that you're going to be in in position i plus one with what probability? Okay. So it basically uh, allows you to learn the spatial relationship between neighboring bins of the genome. Uh, and it reveals distinct subgroups of states and transitions between different groups. Okay, so you can see here that if I'm in a promoter state, you know, uh, chances are I'm going to be staying in one of those promoter states and so on and so forth for uh, transcribed, for active intergenic, and so on and so forth. Okay, so when we let this loose on the genome, we basically said, not, hey, here's a bunch of enhancers, go train on that and figure out what they look like. And here's a bunch of uh, promoters and a bunch of transcribed regions. We basically just told it, here's a bunch of data. And then we used this thing, which seemed crazy when you first heard about it, this baum welsh learning. So this full expectation maximization, learning over all possible start and transitions between states with a full set of all paths ending at this and the full set of all paths uh, going backwards to that. And then all transitions, weighing them, et cetera with a random initialization that basically allowed the system to learn the states that corresponding to different types of patterns in the data. And therefore, the system was de novo discovering these chromatin states. And what we found after the fact, we told the system nothing, we just let it loose on 41 marks across the entire genome. And it came back and it said, oh, well, there's a bunch of states that happen here, and then I'm transitioning to those states there, and so on and so forth. And then we looked at the annotation, and we said, Goldie G, there's a gene. And at the beginning of the gene, I transitioned through all of these early and late promoter states. And then through the body of the gene, I transitioned through these different transcribed states. And then surrounding this gene, I transitioned to all of these active intergenic states. And far away from the gene, I transitioned to all these repressed states. 
it's as if the epigenome had a language and we were decoding it. It, 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 it was truly very empowering to basically say that we take an algorithm that's straight from class and we run it on the genome and it comes back with a parse that basically says, oh, now I know what genes look like. Or more like, I know that there's this type of thing in the genome and then we tell it, oh, you just found genes. And there's this other type of thing, oh, you just found promoter regions. Okay, yeah. That's the next section. <clears throat> Any other questions? Who thinks this is kind of cool? Yay. So um, we basically said, hey, how much power, how much modeling power, how many states did you need to describe the genome? And it basically says, oh, I can just use these three states to capture more than half the genome. And I need two dozen states to capture 1% of the genome. So it's like flying across the US. <laughs> There's huge land masses where nothing much happens. And you can just use one state to encode all of those. And then you're sort of arriving in Boston and you're like, oh, I need 30 states for that. I need one for Somerville and one for, I don't know, uh, Cambridge and one for downtown Boston and, and so on and so forth. Okay. And then you pass through Boston and you're like, oh, I just need one state to describe all of the ocean. Okay. So we have here ocean, here we have continent. And here we have, you know, city center, uh, suburb, et cetera, okay? So tiny little fraction of the landscape requires a huge amount of modeling, which makes a lot of sense. And, the, you know, when we look at that, yes, indeed, these are large scale repressed states. These are broad active intergene states. These are transcribed states. And then the promoter states are only 1% of the genome. It's quite kind of cool. But there's like 20 of these states or 14 different states, okay? So, the modeling power was basically distributed uh, where it was needed. And then you could just look at the whole genome. You could basically, or the whole epigenome. You look at, you know, all 23 pairs of chromosomes. And then what do they actually look like? And you can see here that in the middle, there seems to be something, I don't know, how would you call something in the center of a chromosome? Centromere. <laughs> uh, and then, so, so there's a state that you can see in, you know, many of these chromosomes that is very centromeric. And you see these promoter states that are very densely packed in this cluster of genes on chromosome six, and then a big swath where nothing much happens and so on and so forth, okay? It's kind of cool. So the genome could be visualized across these 41 different chromatin states, uh, or 51 different chromatin states, uh, you know, completely, uh, you know, from scratch. So we knew it was doing something interesting, from this example and from that example across the whole genome, but we didn't know what each of the states meant. So the next question is, how do we actually characterize these states? So we ended up with these you know, 51 things. How do we make sense of them? So we basically brought in everything we had under our hands. We basically said, uh, you know, what's near the transcription start site? What is uh, overlapping uh, reference gene? What is in three prime UTRs and five prime UTRs? what overlaps conserved regions uh, and DNA is one accessible regions and binding of transcription factors and CPG islands and percent GC and what binds lamina regions that we're gonna learn about on Thursday, which are at the periphery of the nucleus and usually repressed and what binds repetitive, what, what, what's found near repetitive regions, okay? And what we found is that we could classify these 51 different chromatin states into major classes according to these enrichments. So again, none of this data was used in learning these states, but after the fact, we could use it to then characterize every one of the chromatin states. And we ended up spending many a night, uh, Jason and I were very nice and very romantic, uh, and we ended up with an annotation of the human epigenome. And it's funny, I, I made Mike Bazin, who's like one of the NIH uh, grant administrators, and he basically told me that above his desk, he has our map of all the chromatin states and what they mean which basically looked like that. I mean, you can see why it was charming. Uh, transcribe five prime proximal high expression and so on and so forth. So it, it's, it's magnificent. So basically out of this crazy, like silly algorithm comes out the first interpretation of the language of the epigenome. Okay. And we can basically find that these states are in fact capturing so much more than what we gave them. Okay. First thing is that different promoter states were enriched in different types of functional categories. So basically, if you look at genes involved in cell cycle or embryonic development or chromatin or response to DNA damage, they were enriched in different chromatin states. That's mind boggling. It's as if the genome is keeping note of what 
function different regions of the genome have, which makes a lot of sense because it actually has to regulate them. We found that there was not just a promoter state where transcription starts, but a transcription end state, that a specific combination of histone modification marks was marking the end of transcription. That's something that was just never known. We, we discovered this um, state that actually has, uh, you know, 112-fold uh, enrichment for zinc finger proteins. That there's a specific chromatin state that the genome packs all of its zinc finger regulators uh, together. And in fact, uh, you know, the, the specific combination of the state formed most of the words of the abstract of this paper. And this was just basically our emission matrix, one, one row of our emission matrix. We found that different motifs were enriched in very different promoter states and very different enhancer states. So we could actually distinguish different classes of uh, regulatory regions. We could find that at 10 KB from the transcription start site, the chromatin state there is quite informative to the level of expression of the gene that's going to come 10 KB away. So the chromatin somehow has a global representation of what's going on far away. And we also could find distinct classes of repressed and repetitive states associated with different chromosomal bands, different types of repeat elements, and so on and so forth. Um, and then we could use that for genome annotation. We could discover new protein coding genes just based on their, evolution, their, their uh, chromatin, their epigenomic signatures coupled with their evolutionary signatures. So we could find places that had a epigenomic signature of a gene and an evolutionary signature of a gene that we're going to talk about in a few lectures. When the evolutionary signature was missing, we were able to discover a new class of large non-coding RNAs, which have promoters, transcribed regions, but not protein coding potential. We could find developmental enhancers, and we could also start annotating different classes of uh, genetic variation associated with disease. So we could you know, assign putative functions to non-coding regions. And we're talking about 2009 here, so that's like a good 10 years ago. And now this is front and center in our research. And then we could ask, well, you know, for different uh, classes of elements, how well can I discover them? How many states do I need? And if you look at transcription start sites, you can basically ask, you know, how many states do I need to discover them? And same for transcribed genes. And you can say, well, if I order the states optimally, or, or if I use individual marks, how well do I discover them? And what you can see is that we are far above what uh, individual marks could do. So we can basically recognize these states uh, quite well. The last question is, how do we select the number of states? How do we select the number of marks we should look at? And um, one way to do that is to basically say, am I successfully capturing combinations of marks that are co-occurring more than expected by chance? And one way to see that is to basically look at, as I increase the number of states from 5 to 10 to 20 to 30 to 40 to 50, what is the observed frequency with which they co-occur? And what is the expected frequency with which they co-occur conditional on the state? And what you can see is that there's a lot more co-occurrence if you own five states, but that goes away to the expectation as you have more states. So that means that you're capturing more of the combinations that are actually meaningful. And then to select that number of states, you can basically use something called the Bayesian information criterion score. You can basically say, as I increase the number of states, do I find that I'm re reaching a peak of explanation and then I'm dropping down again? And the problem with genomes in general is that BIC and other such metrics fail because the genome is ridiculously complex. So the more you know, modeling power you throw at it, the more modeling power it will suck up. And the problem is that beyond 80 states, we simply can't interpret them anymore biologically. So there's no point in going there. So what we ended up doing with Jason is a general strategy that I think you can use in many places, which is you first learn a larger model that captures, quote unquote, all relevant states. And with 80 states, you capture a lot of that. And then you basically take a step of pruning down the states that are kind of boring, that are kind of redundant with each other. So that allows your hidden Markov model 
to capture more than it would by chance with only a 40 state model, for example, because you've gone all the way to 80. And then when you're pruning down, you have already discovered these other states. So you can basically say, are they useful now that I have discovered them? And then using that, you can select some arbitrary cutoff that basically could tell you, yes, I have all the states that I really cared about. And what you can see is that random initialization has much less of this Bayesian information criterion score than this nested initialization that first learns a large model and then prunes it down at every such cutoff. So I can basically learn much smaller models that capture information that I would need to sort of have a much, much larger model for. So I can save at least 20 or 30 chromosome stage for that. Who's with me so far? Awesome. So in the end, we basically learned a 51 state model that captured most of the biology in much, much more complex models. And you can see here that this actually recaptured much more robustly each of these states. As I increase the number of states, you see that they appear and then they're consistently recovered. Whereas there, they appear and they disappear. And I can't pick one model that has all of these cool states. Whereas here, I can pick a single model that has, that, that's capturing most of, the, most of the states. And then you can see here that some states are just not captured at all. And then boom, as you increase, whoop, now they're captured and consistently captured thereafter and so on and so forth. So you can see th this with many, many different uh, biological states, okay? So we talked about epigenomics, we talked about primary data processing, discovering characterization from the states and model complexity. On Thursday, we're gonna talk about how we learn chromatin states jointly, how we impute epigenomes better than we can observe them, and how the genome folds in three dimensions by a factor of 10 to the nine. All right, see you guys on Thursday.